and I'm going to hand over to Mark Kligman. Uh, Mark Kligman is a professor of music at uh, the Milken Lowell, is it the Lowell, Lowell Milken or the Milken Lowell, Mark? The Lowell Milken Centre uh, in UCLA. Mark, it has been a friend, I think it's fair to say, of the European Counties Association for uh, quite some time. We are grateful to him coming here from LA, not least because he's actually nine hours behind body clock, aren't you, Tom? So, uh, but, but Mark has agreed to remain vertical and wait for the whole session. Mark, over to you. Thank you so much, Russell. It's good to see everyone. I think we're just waiting for one more panelist, Sophia. Are you, I hope you'll be joining us. So I think we can all agree that Nusach is an important unifying aspect of our Ashkenazic tradition. Uh, it would be good to provide some comments at some point, please, about the Sephardic tradition, which has its own form, and we'll call it Nusach, with their own, uh, own tradition through Makam and other means. But it's very integral to our Tfilah. So what I'd like to do, we do have a big panel, and so we'll try and ask everyone to keep their remarks in just a few minutes, is I'd like each person to sort of, in their own words, describe the context of their upbringing and learning of, of Nusach, and then to tell us um, just the importance of Nusach. We'll, we'll get in the second question, the second round, as to things that you do and, de and demonstrate. So let's just begin, we'll just go down, we'll start with Sophia. So just please tell us about your upbringing and uh, your context of how Nusak is a part of what you do. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, so grateful to be here. Thank you so much for Alex, Barbara, Jalatin, Russell, and all the team for putting such an amazing um, convention together in this uh, glorious, beautifully restored place. And uh, this is a wonderful opportunity for all of us to learn and to be together. Um, my name is Sofia Falkovich. I live in Paris today. I was born in Moscow in an Ashkenazi family, third generation born in Moscow, before my family was living in Shtetls, mostly in Belarus and uh, also in Ukraine. And then, uh, so everybody wanted obviously to move to bigger cities when it was possible and um, so it happened that uh, during that time the borders were moving and everything was changing. Um, I, I was born at the end of the Soviet Union where there was a lot of um, possibility for or hopes for new, new possibilities, new life, new free expressions. My father was directing a theater in the center of Moscow, and um, so we had a lot of musicians, actors, and uh, journalists at home. Everybody was uh, speaking in a very free way, writing in a non-censored way, um, and this was the approach. This, uh, obviously, we had a very strong sense of our Jewish identity, but the exchange with other views, with other cultures, with other religions was also a very big part of it. Um, my grandmother wrote a whole, um, for, for our family, she gathered, she was writing for five years, doing correspondences with all the relatives throughout uh, in the diaspora in the whole world. Um, gathering information about um, all, all the stories and um, what it was like for Jews to live under Soviet Union. So she wrote um, a lot, a lot of this all in uh, her native language, which is also my native language, Russian. Um, that accompanied with very precise maps of uh, geographic locations and family trees and all these 
incredible, mm, you know, movements that were taking place uh, during the wars. Mm. So when I was little, my, um, I was basically, the, the Jewish identity was transmitted to me through this cultural um, identity and uh, the musical identity because my grandmother was a mezzo-soprano singer. She was a student of uh, Nina Darliak, um, who is um, who is a very famous um, um, operatic uh, soprano and um, the wife of Sedlasa Richter. And uh, but the Jewish identity was very, very relative and very present, and it was kind of this. Not even the sand in the in the cement, but a, a very core um, identity in our family. And so it happened that at the end of the Soviet Union, we moved to Berlin. That's where I grew up. And um, when I was little, I was there was no babysitting, so I would go to to the theater. Um, to watch all the performances, all the rehearsals that um, were happening either at my father's theater or at other places at the opera, at the ballet, um, at the city in Moscow. And um, I would basically had no choice but to compare and or, or, or see uh, like what, uh, how is the acting, what are people trying to say, to convey, uh, what is the purpose, uh, what, how is the scenography, what is the music. and. Um, I was very uh, much uh, attracted to the voices and to 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 what uh, what is behind the performance. What is what are the messages? And I think this is um, in a parallel way what happened to me when I would when I was also little and I could go to the synagogue and listen to to chazanim, um, um, various chazanim. Um, I would also get all sorts of images how um, it was clear to me that uh, I had to be there with them uh, together and I had to, I, I would be, I had no clue how, I had no clue about contorial modes, I had no idea uh, about what it's like, but I had a very, very clear intuition and a very clear uh, vision that basically, like, as if somebody was pushing me, like, I have to, to go there. This is like even against all my um, my angst, my my fear, my um, intuitive understanding that this is not going to be a, a very um, uh, very easy path. But I, I basically had no choice. So um, it so happened. So when I was 14, I, my voice was discovered. I started um, just very quickly to sum up. Um, uh, I was um, I did an internship at the German Opera in Berlin, and then I moved to Canada to study on further with um, with voice uh, professors that I chose to study with. And um, it was clear to me by the end of my studies that I needed um, to 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 be closer to to where I come from. And um, it so happened that. Um, I ended up uh, studying luckily Chazanut five years in Israel and in Germany, and um, then um, life, you know, has um, many uh, interesting ways of um, conducting itself. And um, I ended up who I studied with. Uh, I studied at the Hebrew Union College and at the Abraham Geyer College. So. Um, with, uh, I remember so many uh, professors who have uh, had a big imprint on, on my, uh, shaping my understanding and vision of helping me to find, to continue in my direction with my uh, approach and my voice. Um, be it uh, with the Yiddish uh, collections or uh, with the Chazanut and, uh, you know, I was always very, so the theme today is Nusach, or um, how, how relevant or how important it is. And um, to me, obviously, there is no question that it's very relevant and important because this is like the base um, 
and if you take this away, uh, I don't know like what what else can be left. Mm, I was the, the way we can transmit it today is I, I think there is only one way is through your own examples, through your own passion, and through your personal belief. This is what will be contagious to your congregation, to the rabbi, to um, to people who are um, sensitive or not. Obviously, <clears throat> when people are already interested and already convinced that this is interesting, that this is they have uh, a connection, they have uh, a previous experience, they were exposed to um, cultural arts. It's uh, there's not much work that needs to be done. Uh, but the question is, I think today, how to approach those who, who are not interested, right? This is the question we have. Those who have absolutely no, uh, that are disconnected from it, to some reason. And uh, this has been a question I've been asking myself for a very long time. How, like, is, is this really my task to bring those people in who are um, not interested and do, do not want to be part of this? Um, and today, I, I I do not try to make um, you know I, I do not try to make any forced effort to um, to convince anyone that is not convinced. Um, I believe that people will will come uh, or be convinced uh, when the time is right for them or when they choose to. But it is not. Um, our task to drag them <laughs> and to force them to to listen to something they might not be ready for or not enjoy. I don't know. To my um, well, if if I talk just quickly about the performances, I have a following of people who come, but I also have a lot of people who come and they think it's going to be awful. Like really, like it's going to be like either like music from uh, very old times, music that is not relevant, music that is um, absolutely um, not interesting at all uh, to neither generations. And what happens every time is that there, there is just a huge shift at the end, right? So people come with this preconceived uh, opinion that this is going to be like catastrophe and that it changes. So in, in this way, I think this is what uh, what I said before, um, is that there's nothing force that you can do, just do your job. Thank you so much. I hate to cut you off. Such a fascinating story. Thank you. So what I'd like to ask each panelist to do is maybe just to be a little bit briefer and just kind of give us some highlights just because uh, time's going to get away from us. We'd like to have a conversation with everyone else who's here too. So, but thank you, Sophia. So uh, not to go wrong. Maybe again, just some, you know, the highlights of how you learned, and then. Maybe this one's good. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. So I'm going to be very briefly with the uh, with my the personal story, my upbringing. I grew up in the old city of Jerusalem. I was trained by Canton of Tal Hirschstick and I find myself in uh, Beverly Hills in the last 13 years. And uh, since we are in LA, so I know Professor Mark and I have uh, the pleasure to work with them on developing uh, cantorial and Jewish music programs in the city and beyond. So I will approach uh, this question with going to the source of uh, davening, tefillah. And with your permission, I will start with Rav Soloveitchik. According to Rav Soloveitchik, tefillah, the meaning of davening, is the fact that human being or humanity is always on the edge of, of the major catastrophe. Sakana or etzara, time of trouble. Humanity is always on the edge, always on the threat. 
And tefillah is the response of us human beings in order to be saved. And now I will uh, present the other opinion. The other opinion is that tefillah is not because you are always in a time of troubles, although you know we are in life going through circles, and we are facing sometimes a very hard time, but it's hard to me, I don't know if I'm a little bit disconnecting, but it, it hard to, it, it, it's hard to me to, to say that my congregants in Beverly Hills are always in Ed Sabah. Some of them are having a very good life. And I'm not saying that, you know, normal people are not going through Salah, but let's say, it, you know, one rabbi told me that Rosaloveitchik was in a generation of Holocaust survivors, and Holocaust survivors, they feel always that they are in, a, in, a, in an Eid Salah. But if you take the different uh, second generation, third generation, fourth generation, we are not always feeling in Eid Salah. So, sometimes we are feeling very, very comfortable. So the other approach of tefillah, and that's rooted in our sources, that tefillah is connected to mikdash. Always when you daf and always when you pray, you have to direct your thoughts towards Yerusha. Now, nah. so if we are developing that tefillah, it's a sap or it's a way to. Uh, it's almost like in music you're doing a reduction. You know we. We are speaking the, the, the language of music, you, you, you have some arrangement, you need to do a reduction of something. So we cannot have this Bet HaMikdash, this glorious house, so we're doing a reduction to our cinema. And we take everything that was then, and we try to um, emulate it or, or connect it to that holiness that was there always. So if you build the davening around the idea of Beit HaMikdash. Beit HaMikdash, as we know, had sacrifices, so we cannot have sacrifices in Shul. We do have trouble with meat. Well, we, cannot, we have herring sometimes, but we cannot have sacrifices in, 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 in we, we, the zone in, in Beverly Hills. We're not at all to slaughter cows. So, so what we need to do is, but the other parts can be eliminated, and we know the other parts. What are the other parts of course? present in Beit HaMikdash as a part of the sacrifices, Avodat HaKohanim and Avodat HaLeviim, Leviim LeShiram UleZimram. So we take this part, which is the musical part, and we have this idea of connecting to the ancient source of Kedusha through, through, through Tfilah. So for me, tefillah, Nusach tefillah, the musical form that was established by the Mahari, uh, one of the leaders, of, or the leader, of the Posek of the Ashkenazi community 800 years ago, has, it's a reduction of what we had then in Bet Midrash. And it's a reduction in many, many phases through the year. Ma'agal HaShana that we have. We have Pesach, we have Rosh Hashanah, the Shira, we have Rosh Hashanah, which is uh, the, 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 the tombs of Rosh Hashanah. Every Nusa has a certain part, or a certain expression, express a certain musical structure of Chagim. And, you know, according to Rav Soloveitchik, we are davening, we are in Yitzhara, so there is no place for music. I, I can understand that. And some, some I, I don't want to be generalized, but some of his Talmidim, are against music in, in, in shoes. Why? Because uh, it's, it's a vow. We always have to cry. We do have to cry, but sometimes we have to celebrate. And, and our generation needs to celebrate. And, and we need to be festive in certain times. And we need to understand this rainbow of, uh, of emotion that needs to come out. And the greatest thing that we can have is the music. Beyond that, and I will end with, the, with this idea, it's something that I, I said to, to Mark yesterday. Uh, a part of being connecting to the past, which means the Shah Bet HaMikdash, it's not just being connected to, to the idea of Bet HaMikdash, is to be con connected to our ancestors. And, you know, I, I had a conversation with one of my congregants, and, and, you know, 
he asked me, what is the, the importance of Nusa and Chazanut? And I told them, do you believe that your grandfather comes to show with you? He saw. Do you believe that your family is present here? You're here, you're representing them, and they're here with you. When you say the Yisqor Davani, the Tfilat is called, you believe that they are with you in the synagogue, their souls. They will not understand what you're singing if you're not going to lose this. If you're not going to sing, holy day, they're going to come to your shul and they're going to ask, what is that? The fact that we are singing Nusach has connected us to generations of, generations of Jews, of, of our family. And you, Mr. Congregant, you, when you come into to the synagogue, you sh should want me to speak and to sing the davening in the same language, in the same tune that your grandfather and your family came from, that they can sit and enjoy the, the prayer. Uh, so, you know, I can, I can elaborate that, and, uh, and that a lot, but uh, there are other people and perspectives that I want to hear. So with that one well, Wow, well, I mean, it's a, it's a tall order to, to follow after these two very lyrical, uh, beautiful statements. This is very uh, personal uh, narrative from, from, from Sophia about uh, the persistence of, of memory and identity through, through sound, and from Nazi about uh, sort of on the same theme, but uh, almost from a, like a halachic perspective, right? What are our, what are our ethical obligations to the past, and how can that be expressed in music? Um, so I, I was prepared to to say something kind of different, and m maybe I'll stick with what I was going to say, just so that we have more different different ideas. Because I, I love this, and you know, I relate very strongly to what both of you are talking about. I, I'm from a family of cantors, and. Um, uh, Chazanus is one of the great joys of my life, but I uh, I have a bit of a, um, a problem with the idea of Nusach or with the term Nusach because what I fear happens in the in the present day, and again my experience is Amer as an American, right? So I, I can't talk about the Israeli context very uh, very knowledgeably, and about the European context even less. Uh, but in the United States. The term Nusach is used by Kendras as kind of a cudgel. We have the knowledge. It's called Nusach. And you all have to listen to us no matter what we sound like. Whether, our, whether we are artists who are, of course, people are dominating on the, on the behalf of the Kilo, whether, we're, whether we are speaking as great artists, as great knowers of the tradition, or not. Because we have this knowledge. And what is Nusach? Some notes that are written in a book. And, uh, there's something very painful about this uh, this reduction, so to speak, this kind of reductive quality of what new South has come to mean uh, in the professional cantorial context. And uh, what I would like to uh, kind of uh, beg your indulgence to kind of maybe imagine that new South can mean something rather different than what we currently use the term to mean, right? Or that the sound of Jewish prayer of of, uh, of davening. It can mean many, many different things, and that different chazonim at different times have taken that term uh, to mean something radically different. Because what they wanted, what the chazonim of, uh, let's say, of a hundred years ago, who we revere as having a, embodied a golden age of Jewish creativity, were artists who were deeply creative individuals, and who saw their purpose in life as to speak the voice of the people from themselves, uh, through their own voices, and as creatives. So, uh, I would like to advocate for the idea that one, could, one, should, one might approach the study of Nusach, or of Jewish prayer, from the perspective of sound. What does a Jewish voice sound like? And how might a Jewish singer use the sounds of the past that we can know about through, let's say, through, through older recordings, how can we use those sounds to create something that is in our bodies, that animates the sounds that we know of as being uh, in, a, in a lineage, in a tradition, to create something that can 
speak radically from the, the place of the present. And, uh, okay, so maybe I'll stop there for now. Thank you. I'll first uh, introduce myself. My name is Asher Heidewitz, and I was born in Yerushalayim. What's your name? Asher Heidewitz. Oh, I was born in Yerushalayim. I served as a Hazan in first in Rhodesia, South Africa, London, and for the far, uh, last 45 years, I'm the Hazan in uh, the Shuru Synagogue in Yerushalayim. When I was very young, I had a friend, his, his name, maybe you heard his name, Arya Suma, anybody heard his name? No, he, he was a Hazan for many years in Montreal. We lived door next to each other. And he said to me, would you like to come with me to a children's choir uh, near Machne Yuda in Yerushalayim? There is an old man named Zalman Rivlin, and he gathers people, young people, children, and he trains them. I said, well, maybe. He says, but they give sweets as well. So, of course, I came, and that was my beginning, the introduction of what we call Nusach and Jewish prayers. Now, the subject of our session now is, is Nusach still important in the 21st century? Of course, it's very important. Not only now, it was always important and always will be important. The question is, what is Nusach? And what's the purpose of Nusach? There is also, we say, Nusach Ashkenaz and Nusach Sfarad and Nusach Sfaradi. This is a tradition of how we set the Sidu or the Marzo. This is one Nusach. Nusach Atfila, according to the Ari, etc. But then what we are discussing is the Nusach Atfila, and let me say something. Baalei Tfilot know Nusach more than Chazani. Many cantors know Nusach, and many don't. But Baalei Tfilot, they are the teachers of Nusach, and if they are talented, then they can also become cantors and show off their talents of singing. But one has got nothing to do with the other, and yet they are interconnected. Why is Nusach important? Because without Nusach, we are lost in our prayers. If I will sing something now, which everybody will recognize, you will say, yes, this is done when... You already see yourself in Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. That's Nusach. It does need to be a very complicated melody. I'll give you another example the importance of Nusach that also helps the Halakha. Of course, we are guided in, in the prayers, what we can do and we cannot do in the Halakha, Jewish law. In certain parts of the service, we can interrupt somebody and ask him a question and he may answer you. In certain parts, you cannot talk. 
In certain parts you cannot even answer on main because it's an interruption. For example, between Geula and Fila. Before Shmona Yisrael, you say, Baruch Ata Hashem, Gaal Yisrael, and then you say Shmona Yisrael, the silent prayer. You are not supposed to say Amen after, because it's an interruption. Uh, but it happens that sometimes uh, we have uh, Rosh Chodesh, and you want to remind the people that today in Musaf, we say Adav Yavo, or not even in Musaf, even in Shafrit, or even in Ma'ariv, you don't want to forget that tonight is Rosh Chodesh, and you want to say Adav Yavo. Here comes Musaf and tells you out to overcome the problem, because you are not supposed to say, when the Chazan or the Baal Tfilah says, God is Israel, you must not say, Yale Yabo, don't forget, you're not supposed to do it. So, all you need to do is, and then be divert from the ordinary weekday Nusaf, and bring in just a little bit of the Nusaf of Gimal Galim. For example, the usual say, Baruch Atah Hashem Go'al Yisrael. Hashem Go'al Yisrael. Yes, we remember it. It's, it's, it's a small, small things, but it means a lot. Uh, Israel is uh, quite advanced with uh, high tech. And one of the things that uh, I think comes out of Israel is the, the ways when you drive, ways, you still have ways here, yeah? And then without ways, sometimes you get lost. Nusach is ways. With Nusach, you know where you are. This is Rosh Hashanah. This is weekday. This is Shabbat. This is Shabbat evening. This is Shabbat morning. This is Shabbat Musaf. And this is Shabbat Mincha. That's no sign. Unfortunately, after the Holocaust, things have changed a little bit. Before the Holocaust, communities that lasted for many hundreds of years, they had their Nusaf. There we were doing things. Some things were similar, some things were different from other congregations. But unfortunately, after the Holocaust, whatever you do is good. If you do the Nusach of Eastern Europe, Western Europe, Yekes, anything as long as somebody does it and you didn't make up. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't aware there is such a thing as not singing in Nusach, but in our show, one day somebody on weekday. He said, I've got you outside. And on weekday in the morning. Okay, you got you outside, go in there. He had no idea. Simple things which we take for granted. This is to answer the question. Is Nusa still important in the 21st century? Yes, it is very much. Thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Heller. Um, I am a cantor in Belsen Square Synagogue in London. And I feel very honored to sit here between Asher and Deborah because um, from where I come, uh, I have to tell you, I told Asher in, in Hanover. Uh, I started, and I'm going to answer the question, I don't want to tell you my story because we can spend the night here. And, uh, I just want to mention the fact that I did my bar mitzvah and I had a mentor that was an amazing chazan, rabbi as well, and taught me to lead youth services. 
But when it came to the point that I had to step into the adult service, he didn't have the patience probably to make the recordings for me. So he gave me Usher's recordings. And I learned, I was 14 years old, and I have all these cassettes that Asher made for us to learn Nusach, to learn how to babble. Me too. So I'm, I'm very honored to sit here uh, at the right side, at, at, at his side. And, and Deborah, I have to say, I already told you the secret that I'm going to do your grandfather's Yehirat song. And, and I think that when I, when I, every, Mebarchima Chodesh used the same I don't, I don't, I don't even dream that I would be sitting next to you here. Um, I have prepared something I know Deborah did as well, uh, but that doesn't answer the question you made, uh, Mark, so, so I don't want to get into what I wrote here, but it, it's a little bit related, so probably I can just touch it in a way. Yes? Um, Belsai Square Synagogue is a synagogue that was founded in 38 by refugees that came from Germany and Austria. And um, they very proudly uh, were part of what was the Liberale movement in Germany. And um, before there was even a Masorti conservative movement. And the one thing they mentioned in the first service they had was the Matovu of Lewandowski. Matovu, Matovu. People were crying. People were crying because they, they could feel their homes back wherever they were. And I think that's part of Nusach, that you feel that connection. You just mentioned, Asher, the fact that you, you know where you are. If, uh, if you do a regalim Nusach or you do a, a, a not going into Steigers, but only for, for the locations where we are. And the one thing that I prepared was, uh, it was very difficult to find an English translation of, and I, I don't know how you say it in English, you say preface or preface, or, or whatever, the introduction to Shirzion from Zalman Sousa, a preface. Um, and I spoke to Alex Knapp, who you might know, Professor Alex Knapp is an authority in, in musicology, and, and he referred to me uh, to, I already saw you are going to speak about <laughs> Eric Werner as well, and Eric Werner did, did uh, uh, an introduction when he republished the Shir Tzion in 52, uh, 54, sorry. But, uh, and, there, and there is then a little parts of the, the German which doesn't exist, but I had a lady who is a translator in my community who translated for me parts of that Shir Tzion and also uh, from uh, Corina, from Lewandowski, because I thought there are concepts there that are valid for us to understand what these gentlemen wrote and when they uh, used a different form of, uh, of using the liturgy uh, set in the way they did, uh, they were keeping Musaf. And, and that's what I do and I'm very proud of being doing it. Uh, and I will, I will finish, I won't read everything I have here because maybe there is time later to do that, but to, to, to finish my introduction of what I, where I come from, uh, I've been saying Kaddish for my mother, uh, may she be blessed, uh, finishing uh, Friday as you might know, uh, leading Shachrit and, and, and the Mincha service is the last day of Kaddish for my mother. I've been going to an Orthodox show because our show doesn't have uh, uh, Yemei Chol services, so to say Kaddish, I go to an Orthodox show. And when someone is moved uh, to, 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 to Davon, to the yard side, because they're in the Shiva or so, so they, they're allowed to come on Davon. And there's this gentleman who is probably very knowledgeable and come, goes to a very Yetish synagogue, but he comes to, to this synagogue on Davon's. And the only thing he does is everything in the world of Slicha. Everything. And it, it bothers me. 
And it, I never thought either that I would come to a point where after 50 years I did the bar mitzvah, now I'm in the shul and I don't want to go because I cannot stand this thing. Da, 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 da. Everything, da, 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 da. everything, everything. There is nothing different and you need that difference. You need to hear you need to hear that the changes in the Ishtabat, whatever. The, the whole thing, the Amida is one different thing. You go back to in uh, Tachanun. If you don't know that and you are dominating, even if you're, you're, you should have the concepts and people don't know, and we are the ones who have to teach these people to do the things correctly. so much. Um, there's a term that I learned, Shomrei Nusachot. We are the guardians of Nusach, and I believe in that. Coming from America, um, I must say, when I, I heard uh, the Friday night service from Central Synagogue, so they were able to mix it. They start with Nusach, then you can go into a congregational. I believe the way to keep Nusach important in the 21st century and forever, and, and I will say, I don't want to live in a world without Nusach. I mean, I sound a little strange, but I don't want to ever hear of a synagogue that discards the Nusach. It should never be discarded. We can always find a way to use it. It's like a gem. We have to protect it. We have to use even tiny pieces of it. I'm in a very reformed synagogue. I've been there for uh, 23 years. I've been very happy and I have a lot of freedom. But I insist that there's some nosach in every single service. So only two, and I'll just read a little bit of my thing here because I was asked to bear something and I'll, I'll talk fast. Only two weeks ago, <clears throat> I had the honor and delight of chanting the Geshev prayers. One of my favorite things in the world. What could be more beautiful than that? And they have a, the magic of hearing these modes and beautiful melodies enhance the meaning of the prayers. It's an experience only possible with proper nosach. In this case, the nosach of my esteemed grandfather, Cantor of Kachko, blessed memory. Congregants who are not used to hearing this traditional chant perk up. They know they're experiencing something special, something authentic and awesome, holy and sacred. These moments must be preserved and presented by educated cantors or lay leaders so our musical traditions remain intact. So when did Nazak become important to our synagogue music? I did a little research. We can trace these various modal systems to a medieval past, but Macy Nolman, a musicologist, says that the mid-1800s, for synagogues, it became more prevalent. Shalom Kalob writes about it being important in Eastern European synagogues, but no clear dates. Gershon Efros wrote anthologies that included Nazak, but it was not in musical publications securely until the 1940s. So it was an oral tradition, mostly. Eric Werner wrote in a preface to my grandfather's groundbreaking work, Cantor Adolf Kochko, the source of cantorial liturgy, which the Hebrew Union College published for its cantorial students in 1952. He said, there is yet on the American scene neither a clearly established tradition nor a central ritual to make the decisions needed to establish it. The American cantor has had, therefore, to steer between the extremes of sacrificing both taste and traditions of the plowets of the masses or of clinging to a local minhag or a nesach tr transmitted by some individual cantor and calling this a narrow pseudo-tradition. In other words, cantors often learn from other cantors who may or may not have had a solid education in prayer modes, nusach ha -tfila. It was my grandfather who was the first to compose every single phrase a cantor needs to utter during the entire year with correct nusach, based music, phrases, and pieces, everything a cantor needs to know. In the introduction to this historical groundbreaking Kachko Thesaurus, Professor Eric Werner, head of Hebrew Union College in 1952, said, we recognize in this comprehensive work a potential instrument which might help us to 
to advance toward the coveted Minchag America and could become one of the pedagogic pillars of American Chazanu. In the early promotions from my grandfather's work, it was said that it was the first time that Nusuf was used to compose the entire year of a cantor's liturgical needs. It had not been done before. Shabbat, three festivals, and the holidays. The genius of my grandfather's work is that he made it singable, cleaner. He eliminated much repetition, gave it dignity and musical awe. He was sought after as a teacher and cantor, and he rejected the idea of cantor as performer. He believed the music belonged in the synagogue and not the concert stage. Hence, he was not quite as famous as many of his golden age of cousin who peers. I'm so grateful his music is being taught in the cantoral schools and will continue to be the gold standard for the cantor's repertoire. Nusach is a link to our past and a link to our future. It is the glue that keeps his sacred service together. Even while new melodies, new pieces, exciting congregational moments coexist with it, we need everything to engage our congregants and lift them and their spirits. I say may our prayers be heard with authentic chant and good intentions, kavanah and ruach, and always mess up, even just a little. So thank you to our panelists for uh, these wonderful, beautiful statements. What I'd like to do is just ask a couple of questions for really quick responses, maybe uh, a sentence or two from each, and then we'd like to get to everyone else's thoughts and questions. So I thought this was a beautiful order that we, uh, uh, this really grew very nicely, and I think now we'll go in the inverse order. We'll let uh, Deborah speak first, and we'll come back in the other direction. And what I'd like you to do, and Deborah you mentioned a couple of things about this, is that uh, certainly we all agree that new science is important, and the next step is, um, how do we make it important to others? I mean, you mentioned about the aspect of doing the peticha, or the opening of the Hunaranana in Nusach, and then moving to a melody. I'm sure with the work that you've done, that there are many examples, and of course, it, I think it relates to everyone else on the, on the panel. And maybe just, since we I just want this to go quite quickly in one or two minutes each, just to say, what are some, you know, lived lessons that you've, that you've uh, experienced, that you've done, that really incorporates Nusach? So rather than the struggle, it's there, it's not there, it's how do we provide that subtle uh, example? Thank you. Well, I think we're so blessed by the idea of the Hatima. I think no matter what you do, uh, for instance, I, I you know, Hashkivenu, Hashem, you know, it's the, the Pachabal canon, uh, Danny Massing, Hashkivenu, which my rabbi loves, so I have to sing it almost every Friday night. You know, I really would rather do a kachka now and then, and, and I do, but you can always end with the with the properness, you can always end. You know, you can always finish up, and I think people respect that. I think they like to know that their chazan can involve them and bring them into, um, you know, singing together in, in a very joyous way. But in the end, I don't mind having the final word and, and showing that this is the seal. This is our our tradition. This is our chain. We need to have the messiah. We need to have. We can always add that, and so I, I find that the Hatima is what helps me, especially in a Reformed synagogue, you know, other than the, the normal big prayers of three festivals and high holidays, of course, but, you know, we, weekly, we can always bring some in. After the Mechavoka, you can always do, you always do the Hatima. Ashkivenu, always do the Hatima. Ahavar always do the Hatima. There's a way to keep it as that's that's our, our our northern star in a way, as we say, maybe our eastern star. But it's 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 our guidepost, and I, I think we can keep that and with new things. Wonderful. So, Paul, you're working at a synagogue that is so devoted to Lewandowski. Um, how do you engage with? Yeah, uh, well. person to ask is uh, Isidoro. He is the Lewandowski cantor. I, I'm, I'm also the, the Sulzer and the Namburg. Um, um, yes, I, I will answer your question with uh, one of the, the things I, I did uh, get from Alex Tapas that I should look into uh, Edelson's uh, Jewish music, uh, which has a lot about Musaf. 
but it has it, the chapter about soul sir. And, and if I share a little bit about that, that will answer your question in a way, because what they did, Lewandowski and Sulzer, is in a way try to bring the older generation, I read from the book, uh, page 249, the old generation should recognize a familiar and endeared element, while the young generation should be educated to appreciation of it. So what we do in Belsais is there is a progression. Um, I'm talking about high holidays now. Uh, we have a Minka service led by youth. We have a youth choir, we have also an adult choir of uh, professionals, and we have a community choir. But the Minka service is led only by youth. And they learn from recordings. We have all the music. It was a big enterprise of Bells has to put all the music into digital form. So they have the, the, the availability of getting all this music and listening to it, preparing. And they grow from that into lead, uh, Shacharit of uh, Secondary Rosh Hashanah. And then they progress into doing Yom Kippur Shacharit. The Hazan does Musaf. But there is a progression of children that are post bar mitzvah, uh, uh, bat mitzvah, because now girls are leading as well. But that's a new thing in Belsize, it started a very few years ago. And um, they learn and they appreciate it, they, they grew up with it. So, for example, I had a, a Nela service this year with uh, one of the members of the synagogue who grew up, uh, has a lovely uh, alto voice. And we did together some things. So we did duet, uh, duet for for Al Tashlichenu. We did Shvakulenu together. We did even the German Gedusha together. So she grew up with it, and that's I think that would answer what Sulzer said as well: that we should educate the younger, younger generation, and they should feel they are at home and they recognize the melodies that are set naturally in Musa because that's what they did. So we've established that education <laughs> is very important. Asher, you've had a lifetime of experience. Uh, what wisdom do you have to share for us in terms of how we can help educate the next generation? Well, there is a problem, but we can, we can overcome it. When Kalibach came on the scene, some people thought it was a good thing and some said that it's not, but whether we like it or not, it's there and it's there to stay whether we like it or not. However, when you sing his melodies, especially for Kabbalah Shabbat, it's wonderful. You come into a shul, wherever you are, you hear that melody, and you feel it home. It's not Nusach, but <laughs> maybe one day it will be called Nusach. <laughs> we call it already Nusach Halibah, by the way. That's the good news, but the problem is that when we finish, I think you mentioned the ending part of the phrase, but with Kalibach it doesn't happen. The melody goes on and on and on, and when the text is finished, the la 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 goes on. And the young generation may forget or not even remember that there is a, such a thing. Uh, so, what I do is I start ta da 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 and the continue the congregation goes on and they go on and go on and when they're finished they say the la 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 and then I go back to do the way you used to do it before Carly Bach. So they have it this way and that way. Another thing that happened in the last few years, even in the very orthodox Yeshivot and very orthodox synagogues that are very, 
very strict with the Nusach, etc. Beautiful melodies are being heard from time to time. One is probably, you recognize it, when we open the ark on Rosh Hashanah in Kippur. Ochil, Ochil, You cannot touch it. But somebody wrote a tremendous, beautiful melody. And it conquered the world. Now, people want it. If you don't do it, you spoil their service. So I thought about it and I said, okay. Let the people sing. I keep quiet. When they're finished, I do the traditional Nusach. So sometimes you have to think, or be creative, how to preserve the old and yet promote the new. Thank you. John, I thought, um, not really here to familiar with all the work that you do, though we become familiar with it as the, the days of the uh, convention go on, but you're involved in so many creative projects. I'm just curious how Nusach plays a role, which I know it's a central role. Yeah. I, my, because I don't work in, in synagogues for the most part, my concept of fidelity to Nusach as a body of music that has to remain static is different than the other, the other uh, esteemed members of the panel who are uh, pul pulpit cantors. Uh, my, my thought about Nusach is that it, it goes hand in hand with a conception of voice, of vocal production, of sound quality, of uh, forms of affect, ways of, of expressing emotion. And uh, uh, to my mind, uh, Nusach as a, a kind of a, a quasi-classical body of music that m must be performed uh, in a, in, in a, uh, according to a specific system, doesn't really work without a co-commitment aesthetic, a Jewish vocal music aesthetic. And when, when I think about Nusach, I, I, I want to think about uh, what, what aesthetic tools are needed for people to be able to learn how to create a vocal sound that will convincingly convey these melodies in a way that uh, is, is legible as Jewish. Right, so if someone is singing these melodies, uh, but there is no um, no juice to it, no, then there's not there's not much there's not much uh, purpose in it, to my mind. Um, so uh, when, when in my own creative projects, uh, I'm thinking as more about what is the uh, emotional, affective world that is being created by the sound of the cantor's voice, or the kind of the uh, the, uh, the histrionics of, of the theatrical qualities of, of, of cantorial performance, and how can those be harnessed to, to something that is uh, effective? That's great. Uh, not to, what I'd like to, if you want to say something, please do, but what I'd love, love you to comment on is, um, Nati and I have had the pleasure for what, the last six years of doing this lift up without COVID or something like that. And we, through Nati's direction, not mine, it, we've built a beautiful slip up service, which really combines Nusach and a lot of more modern Israeli melodies, which is very important to the community that we, that we live in. And I'm just curious maybe how, you know, how you make those choices and, and you know, because Nusach is so much a part of what we do, but it's not the only thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you, you do have to take, take some compromises here and there. But uh, I always try, I'm trying to, and it's the same line that Asher Rinovich uh, 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 walked through, to preserve the Nusach by taking the popular melody and and insert them in the places that they are, they are um, they are uh, appropriate for the Musa. For example, I'm taking the famous Kalimach of, uh, of um, uh, 
Moshe Ve'Aron. So I'm singing it in Mimkomo. With an Mimkomo, with an Mimkomo. And then the congregation, of course, the synagogue is booming when, when I'm singing this melody. The roof is, is, is exploding. And, and then I'm coming back to the, 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 the melody is in the Nusa. It's in the freaky mood. Or for example, if I'm tired to do it the same place every time, I'm switching, taking the same movie, and... Or for example, uh, the other melody, uh, Sim Shalom. Take the Sim Shalom. So, very boring. I take the melody of uh, Hava Nagila and sing to Sim Shalom. And it's, it, I mean, it has pros and cons. I mean, it's a, it's a very, you know, used melody. But a lot of time when I have the city, I have people from this coming into the synagogue that are not. And our synagogue is very colorful. I mean, I mean, they are very, I have 20%. 40% Shomri Shabbat, uh, and the rest are less, even, you know, each one on his, on his own way. But I have a lot of people that are coming in and they're not observant, so to speak. Uh, and sometimes they are five, six times a year, sure, you know, coming to Sushi. When they hear this melody of Abba they're dancing. I mean, it's a celebration. So always to do the, I will, I will not call it shatnez, you know, shatnez. <laughs> you always have to, to, to uh, make peace between the Kalimath and, the, and the, all the popular, uh, popular music with, uh, with, uh, with the Nusach. And there is a way, there are ways to do it. Uh, the second thing that uh, I'm elaborating on what Paul said, it's education and education and education. Uh, I'm writing a Tinmian once a month. So I'm starting Shacharit in the main synagogue, and then I'm switching at 10 o'clock, and I'm running a Tinmian. And running a Tinmian, it is basically running a Tinmian, a teen service. Yeah, teenagers. So I'm, I'm meeting with them during the week. I'm, teaching them how to do that field. They lead it themselves that field. They are the leaders of Shakrit and Musaf. And I'm there for them to... Yeah, yeah, and I'm teaching them. I'm trying to, you know, not to to, uh, to throw some complex Nusaf uh, teachings that I got from uh, Kachko or from Uftali Herstik. But I do, I do for some of them that they're very talented and I have some of them. So I'm challenging them and giving them more to do. Uh, adult choir, it's very important, from the congregation, not just professional choir, having, you know, some people, members, singing, and that's what we're doing together with Mark. Uh, concerts, concerts, you're a cantor, you're, you're, you know, you have your own synagogue, you have to do five, five or six times a year, and not just concentrate on, on one concert a year and do it very fancy, do, like very Sunday morning, I call it coffee concerts, we have this concept in our synagogue was very successful before COVID now we're trying to, to go back to that. Sunday morning, 11 o'clock, we're doing a nice concert, no, not, so, not, not so fancy, but with explana explanation, explanatory concert, and we're trying to teach, uh, teach the congregants and teach the participants of the concert what we are doing, uh, why we are doing it, and we do it consistently. There is a, there is a, and, and it's on all levels, when you're approaching the kids, you're doing the Tinmin. By the way, the Tinmin Yang, yes, they meet it once a month outside of the synagogue, but then every six months, they're taking over the synagogue and they're doing everything. 
So, so they're doing shakrit and stuff, and they made sure it's a way to, to, for them to express their abilities for the congregation and to see. Uh, from a PR perspective, it's good for the cantor to do because now everybody knows what he's doing. Uh, been asked what you're doing during the week. Yeah. So when 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 you see when you see five, six, uh, or ten teenagers, uh, you know, doing the, the, the prayer, and you said to you said to the members, look, I sit with them once a week, and this kind of so you you're representing. You have a body of work to represent to the congregation, and that's the way to to teach new stuff. So basically. We are up to the line that uh, famous line that Rav Kook said. At Sadikim Amitim Shabador Inam Kuvlim Al Arisha El Amosifim Tzedek. Instead of complaining that nobody knows Nusach, the way to to deal with that, to tackle this problem, is to go see all, to light your own candle as a cantor, and to educate and to do better and positive things. And that's the way to to deal with that. Thank you. So one, you asked, yeah. uh, you asked for one example, uh, one short example. So this year I was uh, asked um, um, at UNESCO for to uh, close the annual memorial service, uh, memorial day, with closing prayers at the UNESCO headquarters in Paris. And so the first question is, uh, what prayers do we choose? So this is an obvious question. I think anybody knows the answer to this after all these speeches and some musical performances. And Madera Famim and Kaddish. The second question is, in which melody do I sing it? Here we go, Musa. So, uh, well, this is this is obvious, so um, I take risks and I like to experiment and obviously when I uh, pray and each performance like this is a prayer at first and always is an underlying prayer behind it and throughout it, um, but obviously I expand it and I make uh, my own creative interpretation out of it, but I think you hear all the references um, at least I hope that you can listen to it on the, uh, the UNESCO uh, channel or on my YouTube channel and actually tell me if it succeeded or not, I would be curious to know. But this is just one small example. You asked, um, how do we... So to me there is no question that Musa is very important and uh, needs to be kept up and developed. to jump in on this because I think that we can um, commission music today that incorporates Nasa. I have a good friend Beth Stiles and I've tried to um, introduce her music to a lot of uh, cantors in America because it's just so wonderful and spiritual and loving and it's you know I think it, I think it's just very usable and I've told her that I want to take a piece of my grandfather's music and then continue with something contemporary, and then go back to the old. I think people need to hear the sounds, and there's no reason why we can't commission composers today to use authentic Nassau, um and you know create something amazing and 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 have a, a Fatima as well. Um, just an example for Amshah Amshem during the holidays. I, I do a, the traditional, and then I do a beautiful version by Leon Sher, and uh, it works out great because you have. Right? And then, and it's just goes from one to another. I love it. It's, it's comforting, and you still have tradition. So I think we could all think about commissioning music that uses Nusa today. It doesn't always have to be old. Why is it only from the 1950s? Why can't we use it? And I still haven't heard many new composers use Nusa in a good way. I'm waiting. So I think maybe we shouldn't wait, we should just insist on it and pay someone to write something decent that we'll actually want to use. I, I commissioned for, for Slichot, we didn't have anything for Ashbe. So uh, our choir master, Benjamin Wolf, uh, was 
very talented, wrote. He used the, the moment for Slichot to, to write the Ashre, which became a choral piece, you know. So we can't. Uh, I, there is a famous recording, I don't know if you heard, it circles around of Genshoff doing the Ilat. You heard this? Live Genshoff. Amazing. Look it up. And um, so I have it in my. I, I have to sing the Hashem Hashem that you said. I have to do it. And I cannot, second, <laughs> third, I cannot do anything. No, it's, it's for us, it's, 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 it's impossible to divert from this tune. So, for example, on Meila, or on Erev Yom Kippur, Slichot of Yom Kippur, and Kippur night. Everybody here is Genshof? So, so that's Genshof, and then. So, so I mean, this trying to combine the, the popular the popular tunes with the, with the, with the quotes of the Nusa. Uh, that's something that we we're, we're doing on a regular basis. All of us. I mean, everybody in, in his own ways, in his own capabilities, and in, in his own board and president and rabbi. But we'll we are get doing to hear you do it, Friday morning. What? We'll get to hear you do it Friday morning. Friday morning. Or Friday afternoon. So, um, before Russell rings the bell in 16 minutes, um, we have some time for questions, comments that people have, and we invite you. Please, Alex. Do you want a microphone, Alex? Uh, I think I can, you can hear me. Yes. 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 Oh. Education, education, education is what I keep hearing from all the panelists. And it's so important. Mm. Who is actually going to educate our children if it's nothing of Nusaf is taught in any of the Jewish primary schools or the kindergarten type age? We used to learn it in the children's services. It was part and parcel of how we were brought up in Anglo <coughs> Jewry. I mean, Asher would know this, and uh, others who were brought up within the United Synagogue of Great Britain in the early 1950s, even from, maybe from Victorian times, when the, when the Blue Book was formed and the various other books were notated, and we had the London Board, and we had children's services, junior ones and senior ones. Everybody knew Nusa. It, they didn't call it Nusa, but you don't tell little children, this is Nusa for this, this is Nusa for that. It's the popular tunes for Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkah, Shavuot, Pesach, the melodies that were incorporated within the beginning of Nusach and at the end of that, what you did in between was a minhag of the community and, and you can embellish this. So as long as you knew what to say, as was told by our panelists, how to end, how to begin. In between, to understand the musical of the words of the tefillah, which I'm, Asher will talk about in his session, to interpret the words and to embellish the words within the right music and the right tunes to encompass what you're actually saying. People don't understand what they're talking about. Do we have teachers who are going to teach the stuff? Are our schools, HUC, you know, um, Taki, wherever it might be, are the teachers competent enough to understand the stuff and to teach it? Who is the next generation? who's going to teach it. If we can't teach it from the kindergarten stage, what are we going to do? How are we going to include it? Does it have a future? So bringing in the Karl Marx and the other thing pushes that aside, our traditions, and then moves something in its place. Is that the right thing to do? Or does one go parallel, side by side, and you can incorporate both schools or different thoughts? There is Eastern Europe here, Western European stuff. The Americas have adopted the East, the Europeans and England have adopted the Western Ashkenazi according to the German and the Polish tradition. People don't know what I'm talking about. Generally, if you go to a synagogue, 
whether it's a reform synagogue or an orthodox synagogue in Great Britain, there is no communication. There's no Jews college, there's no teaching schools, there's nowhere for anybody to learn. So how do we continue what your grandfather did, what Asher's teachers have done, Natty's teachers in Taki, and so on and so forth. When, when the Jackie Mendelsons of the world, and the, and the A. Boobins, and the Brills, and all these, and the Natalie Hurstie disappear, who's going to teach our children? That is the problem. Do we have any solutions? I don't know. Does the panel have any answers to what I'm saying? I don't know. Well, I'd like to hear that. Please use the microphone, Mark. I think that the cantorial schools in America are doing a, a good job of teaching us off. Whether they use it a lot in the pulpits when they go out in the world, I, I, I don't know. But I think they I, could use it a lot, but it is being taught. It is being taught. What I hear, is the campus who come from the, these schools go into the congregations because they, either the congregations can't read or understand the sermon or can't follow you. <clears> so they do children's services for adults. And the children's service take over the what we call the traditional normal service. I, I, and I don't say this yeah. blandly. I said what I hear on Zoom or what I hear on that. Lockdown has taught me to go from place to place to place to place, take my blinkers off, and, and listen to what's going on in the world. And this is what I hear. Well, I am in touch with a lot of cantors across the country, and I think I think they all want to keep a little tradition and they want to learn, they want to introduce a lot of new things. But I think there is that thread and there is a respect to holding on to some of the... So, they do make us laugh, they do make us think, they do make us finish mm -hmm. Friday night, the who will be the favor of my children, etc. Et Every generation asks the same question. I mean, what you said, Alex, very right about that. And you never write about, about what's going on in conservative in the reform movement. The problem is that, I mean, not to criticize any movement or my movement, but to, to tell the, the, what's the reality on the ground. I mean, most of your congregation are not, I mean, some of your congregation are not daily, Shabbat, daily coming or Shabbat coming. So there is a problem of reaching out. So, I mean, you, we, are, we are teaching in a bubble, so to speak. That's your challenge. That's the movement, uh, the movement of, of uh, you know, the movement challenge of the conservative and the reform. My movement challenge is that, as, as Alex says, people are too present in the synagogue because they have to, they have to. But there is no any tools in education to to get this, and it's done by the local cantor by his own, you know, initiative. Uh, whatever he wants to work or he doesn't want to work, whether he's bored for him or not, whether he has the vision or not has the vision or doesn't have the vision, that depends on him. But there is no any institution. And as far as I know, in England the situation is that there is no any full time cantos. So why they should go and teach the community if they are not being paid? So that, that, I mean that's a that's a structural problem. And that's I mean as long as you don't have people on the ground that they teaching the kids. Uh, or they involved in schools, you're not gonna you're not gonna solve the, the problem. The problem may be solved in packets where there are people that they do care about uh, about that, uh, either because they are employed full time, either because they care about that. But they, but I mean, in general, this is a problem. Yeah, but I look by from your lips to the institutions that should do this work. Yeah, you know, I follow what you say, Debbie, uh, and mm -hmm. I understand. Nazi Scott hits the problem right on the nail. Unless people invest in the future, there's no future. So what is your priority? To invest in people, our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, learning to do something. Whether they keep it or not, it's a knowledge. It's like somebody has to say Kaddish, but they can't read Kaddish, or they don't know how to say it. Simple, well, so they are the least use it in English, whatever it might be. People have a yard sign, people have to sit shiver. They don't know because they haven't been taught or they've been forgotten. 
It's just the basis of other facts that as long as you teach it, forget, you don't have to keep it, you can go to any synagogue or belong to any movement you want, no consent, Masorti, Reformed, Conservative, Conservative, Orthodox, it doesn't matter. But to understand the little basis, the other facts of what we need to know. If you don't have battles in, in, with consonants, you can't read the language. So if you don't understand the dictum or the, or the, 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 the language itself, which is difficult enough, how are you going to teach anybody? Who is our teachers? Who is the teachers of our teachers? What is my children, grandchildren, great grandchildren going to come into this world and know? Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. We I have just... some other comments that would like to be made. Yeah. Uh, Amalia? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, my name is Amalia Kedem. I come from Yerushalayim. I had the privilege of hearing Asher Heinovitz from a very, very young age. Can you hear me? Better with that than my They will not hear me. They will. They will. So I have, I have well, like two, okay. I have two questions for you. Uh, one is how do you how do you handle the problem of duplicating new stuff with the new tunes as you um, uh, suggested that you do with ochila or with other tunes? Eventually, the tunes in the synagogue change in time. Before Lewandowski, there was there were other things. Right? There was Nusa before Lewandowski, and then Lewandowski came in, and then old tunes were neglected, and new ones came in. Now, you describe uh, your solution to having both Nusa and the new tunes, but that duplicates the service. So, so there is a limit to the time you can keep people in the synagogue, right? So, how do you handle that? I don't know. No. That, that's my question, because eventually some tunes you will give away, and then new tunes will come in, no? Two things. If, if, if it's a short... <laughs> if it's, no, it's, can you hear me? Uh, it's no. better with. It's better with. Yeah. If it's a short uh, duplication, no big deal. I, I, I can think about a very long one, but let's... For for, for the theory, let's say there is a long one. So you cut your cloth accordingly, so you make it quicker here, and uh, you, you give more time here. Uh, there is a, you have to be creative, that's all. Uh, for example, I, I have to do it when uh, we want to finish in a certain time. Not uh, it happened now. We read Kohelet. Kohelet takes a long time. <laughs> half an hour is to do it very quickly. In half an hour. Yeah. And and they asked me, please, we, we, we don't want to go home very late. So we did the Shachrit much quicker. The Musaf we didn't uh, prolong. And uh, we went home reasonably early, so... But can you imagine a reality where you will dismiss a piece of Nusach in favor of a new... If, if it's what we call Nusach Messinai, which is a very important piece of Nusach, you don't touch it, you don't... But, but, but if, if it's a, a melody that... Uh, Lewandowski, Lewandowski, Lewandowski is okay, you can, uh, you can uh, not sing it for one Shabbat. Uh, I doubt. You, you come. <laughs> Some people. Yes. Yeah. Huh? My other question, thank you. My other question was, uh, can you tell us if uh, Zalman Rivlin uh, also had the entire Nusach? Did he teach the children the entire Nusach for the year? Just like, well, he didn't write down his music, we know that. But, uh, yes, you're right. So maybe he... He, he, he was a very unique person. He, he, he loved to teach the children. He got no money for it. He, 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 he took it from his own pocket. What he did is, he 
introduced, introduced me to the world of Nusach and later on, because of him, I continued. But the foundation, you, you take a child and you teach him a melody, how to say, Lech, Lechu neranena la Hashem, Nariya letzurisheinu. For a little child, it's, it's, it's a big job. But slowly, 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 when you look back, Zalma Rivlin wasn't a great uh, composer, he didn't create big melodies, but he was an educator. We're talking about education. He loved the children, the children loved him, and he gave them the beginning. And later on, each one went on his own way. Asher, I want to ask you about uh, uh, Zalma Rivlin, because I think it is a great figure. Because I heard about him, because I grew up in Jerusalem too. And I mean, I heard so many people that they were influenced by, by his teaching in Davini. And I wanted, he was basically a descendant of the Talmidea Gai. Oh, yes, yes. The Rivlin family, even Ruby Rivlin, who was our president not long ago, is part of that clan. And the, the Gaon of Vilna, the Vilna Cohen, he sent his uh, Talmidim to Eretz Israel. And the, the Rivlin family uh, is, a, is a very famous family, and each one of the Rivlin family was, uh, <laughs> was very, very high in his field. Whether we had the one ambassador, uh, Rivlin, in North America, and uh, so on and so forth. So, Asher, the Shudcha, with your permission, I want I wanted a little bit concentrate about the fact that Zalman Rivlin was a descendant of the Gra, and the Gra had a teaching that he said that Echala Megina. You're right. Echala Megina, You're right. You're right. Asher, can can you? Well, you you, about that? you are now coming into the world of uh, of mysticism of of, of Kabbalah. You know, we've got the, we've got the Pshat, Rash, and then we've got the Kabbalah. In the world of Kabbalah, which I know nothing about, uh, we have uh, different stages of how to reach, uh, so to speak, into heaven. Yes, yes. And uh, it says that one step before the ultimate, in English, you call it pal, pal ultimate, pal ultimate, yes? Penultimate, it's a good word, isn't it? Uh, is, is music. Once you reach the, 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 the world of music, the next is Ruach HaKodesh. You, you are up at the top. So, so uh, uh, Asher, basically... Just one second. The joke is, they say, Chazonim Zalim Naronim. You heard about it? They, told, they say it also about tenors. They say tenors are fools. <laughs> no. It, so, why? The, the simple reason is because many people think that they can sing and they, they cannot <laughs> sing and that is stupid. But they say you reached already the level of music and you don't go one step further, you are a fool. So, I, I, I want, just to, to, to close with that uh, idea of the gra, I, I believe that Rav Zaman Rivi kept a tradition of Talmidei I mean, Reb Zaman Rivi, he was Zaman Rivi, but I mean, there were many people before him that had the same music. I mean, Zaman Rivi grew up in a place and he took this tradition and he teach it to you, but basically, Moshe Musar Torah, Yoshua, Yoshua, Iskenim, so it was a chain of, of, of tradition that was passed down, yeah, and in the past, yeah. And maybe it's, a, it's an opportunity to remind everyone that of the tune for What about it? It's from Zalman Well, I learned something from you. I did. I, I, I'm so used to it, but I didn't realize that... Uh, wow. So we have a date. It's not before oh, the 20th century. Wow, it was worth coming here just to hear it. <laughs> so what I wanted to say that it, it takes it takes a good composer and a good tune yeah. Yes. To keep Nusaf Well, sometimes for one melody you make uh, you made your name. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, next is the
השם שלי דוד גולד, מיכאל סה דוד גולד, ועוד איך בנפור בודפסט, ועוד איך כבר היא דבר קורה. And surely, excuse me, I am from here. And I would like to do some very small thing to the Maharil, told a simple story. Somebody at Kantor sang a Rosh Hashanah, not the Nusa of the place. And the next year he died. And uh, so it's the Nusa is is very uh, very uh, ang Karobla Makom the uh I I thought you you were born in uh Presbul. My father. Uh -huh. Uh, and your melody is from Pressburg. And uh, this is one, one thing, and it's, it's very, very important that we, we are in a time <coughs> a lot of people replaced. We don't have a long time the same place, and we cannot uh, learn the tradition of our fathers. This is what, uh, and the other thing you spoke about is the Missinai melody. The very important melody, it's, I, I think it's eight, eight melody that uh, knows as Missinai melody that Kadosh Baruch uh, Natal uh, Moshe, that, that's not true, but it's very nice. Thank you. So we have uh, one, uh, one final question. I think that also come to Meisner, you, you learn with them, uh, someone with them too? Meisner. Penny, did you learn with Rivlin? Did you learn with Rivlin? No, no. No, no. Okay, Daniel. Today in New York City there are three, four discos that are that are extant, that are very, very commonly heard in the in the Hasidic community. So you have Nusach Poil and Nusach Hungary, and they're vibrant and alive, in addition to the Litvish Nusach, the Kachko Nusach, that, that is, uh, is performed in the, uh, in the liberal movements. So it's uh, the, the idea of there being multiple Nusachs in the same, in the same uh, place is that actually it's still alive and, and real in, the, in, uh, in New York. In the, in the Hasidic, in the Hasidic yeah. uh, the, Okay, the, so one final comment from Daniel. Hi. Um, I just wanted to offer an observation which I'm a tiny bit surprised I didn't think I heard from any of the panelists. There's a very celebrated midrash based on several verses in the Sefer Breshit, which of course we are in the middle of reading at the moment, that the Avot, Avraham Yitzchak and Yaakov, intuited respectively Tefillat Shacharit, Tefillat Mincha, and Tefillat Ma'ariv. And whether you believe that to be literally true or just figuratively true, you can also demonstrate from those verses that their inspirations were based on different states of mind and the states of mind that we have at different times of the working and resting day. And that because, of course, the actual text of Tefillot that we have was canonized a great deal later and we have a substantial amount of repeated material between the Tefillot, there's an Amidah in each of them, Ashrei comes three times, Shema comes twice, and so forth. The differentiator, the thing that makes you feel that what you're saying at different times of day is differently inspired depending upon your feelings and the feelings that you should have, surely is the musical overlay. That is the Musahat Fila. And what we're really about here is how deeply we can pick our way through our obligations of Tfila and make Nusach make us feel as we should be in relation to the Tefillot that come through our daily and weekend and festival routines. If I may give you a slightly facetious example, on Rosh Hashanah we eat honey cake, on Shavuot we eat cheesecake. Why not the other way around? 
why would cheesecake taste just as good on Rosh Hashanah? The answer is because it's something in that that in a rather earthy sort of way makes you feel right about that time of year. It's the same with the music of the Tefillot. That's my observation. I just want to add there on what you said. The perspective that you brought that Tefillot Mishum Avot Tiknun, there is another idea, Tefillot Mishum Korbanot Tiknun, which is the, the other idea. But with the same idea of Tefillot Mishum Korbanot Tiknun or Tefillot Mishum Avot Tiknun, you can say that in the Beit HaMikdash there was a Shir Shel Yom. And the Shir Shel Yom was sung uh, twice, in the morning and in the evening. And each time it was sung differently. For each day you had a different tune, you had a different setup of, of music. For each Shir Shel Yom. So in a way, in a way, the idea of Tfilot Mishum Avot, that representing two different emotions and times, and Tfilot Mishum Kobanot, we can wrap it in the same uh, in the same motion, and we can say if, if we wanted, you know, just to to uh, uh, symbolize the, the the job of the chazan is basically to be the coin and the levi together, combination of being coin and, and, and levi and a teacher uh, for the congregation, and that's the, the the idea. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking all the panelists. For